All right, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Quinn Peterson. It's K-W-I-N. My father wanted to name all of his kids after radio stations. And I'm the oldest, so I got the radio station name, and then my mom put her foot down and said, no more of that. Um, I, my first job was in radio. I grew up in a radio station. I've been in communications for a long time. And today I want to talk to you about a communication medium, email. And the title of my presentation is Control Email, Not the Other Way Round. Does anybody disagree with that statement? <laughs> Melanie raises her hand. Melanie, your uh, email controls you. All right. And that's why this is so important. This is my family in Washington, D.C. Last month, we got in our car and we drove for 15 days. We drove all across the country. We've seen everything. There is nothing left in the country. We now have to move to a different country because we saw it all. But what's significant about this picture is that a year and a half ago, this would have been inconceivable for me. There is no way I could have taken 15 days off of work. I could not have let it go mentally, and my job could not have let me go because I was up to here in it. I was, and a big part of this was that I was checking email all the time. Um, so I want you to get more in control of your email so that you can have the freedom like I experienced here a couple of weeks ago, to live your life the way you want to, to be in control of email and not have it control you. There was a study that was done by the McKinsey Company in 2012, and they were studying American email habits. Can anybody guess what number goes behind this question mark? How much time do Americans spend on email every week? The American workers spend about 28% of their time on email. That's a quarter of your time. Let's do the math on this for a second here. 28% of a 40-hour week is over 11 hours. Is there anything else you do that takes up 11 hours? Any other single task? Now ask this question. What if you got twice as good at email? Meaning you did it in half the amount of time. You would have five more hours every week. What would you do with five more hours? Would you leave the office at 5 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock? Would you leave your laptop in its dock on your desk and not take it home? Okay, see how this really represents a big chunk of time? And you can actually get twice as good at your email, even more. And in order to show you how to do this, I'm going to present three concepts. I'm going to issue five challenges. And if you do those five challenges, you will fundamentally change your relationship with email and you will gain a lot more time. How much time really depends on kind of where you are now, but also how well you implement the challenges. So are we ready for the first concept? All right, here it is. Just don't check your email. <laughs> okay, when was the last time you checked your email? Corey, when did you last check your email? Right, right before you walked in. Well, okay, nobody is checking their email right now. Thank you for not being in here checking your email. Um, when do you think I last checked my email? I will tell you, it was July 22nd of 2012. So over a year ago, and yet nothing terrible has happened to me. <laughs> so I guess it comes down to how do I define checking email? What is checking email? It's basically opening up your email program just to see what's there. My thesis is that it is not productive and it's not helpful. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, does everybody still have a mailbox attached to their house? Okay, a few of us have mailboxes attached to our house. Can you imagine going out to your mailbox, opening it up, pulling out the 20 letters or so, and you flip through them, and, okay, I'm gonna do it, and, and putting 19 of them back in the, email, in, in the box, closing the lid, and then taking that one message inside your house, sitting down, opening it up, and throwing it away, and then doing this every 10 minutes for your entire day. That would be ridiculous, but that is how we do email. And why do we do it that way? Well, I think the biggest reason is because it's a habit. You know, the first thing you do when you get to your desk, right? Click, what's in my email? You finish a project, well, what should I do next? Click, you come back from lunch, uh, click, you check your email. And that's fine. Habits we can fix habits we can change, 
The bigger problem is when we go to our email because we desperately need hope. And what do I mean by hope? I mean, I do not want to do these expense reports. I hope there's something more interesting or urgent or distracting in my email. Oh, good. Something from HR with an exclamation point on it. I got to do that right now. Thank you, email, for rescuing me from the expense reports. This is a problem. Has anybody ever done this, fled to your email to avoid that pressing problem that was on your desk? Yes? OK. I'm the only one. All right, that's fine. You don't need to raise your hands. Checking is useless. It makes you an observer. It's passive. So what do I suggest doing instead? I suggest processing your email. It's a shift in mindset. Processing makes you a doer. It actually gets something done. And, and here's how processing works. There's been some research recently on how the brain works. And our brain is not so much a computer as it is the RAM that's in the computer. And that RAM, just like a RAM in our physical computers, gets full. Turns out the brain's not particularly bright. But what it is really good at doing is asking questions. And so when you get an email from the bank, your brain will look at that email and it will do its job. And it will ask the question, what should I do with this? And it will keep asking the question, what should I do with this? until you tell your brain what it is you plan to do with that, and at which point the brain says, OK, fine. I'm not going to think about that anymore. We've made the decision. And it's fine to have a couple of those open loops running in our mind. You've all experienced it, where you're sitting down, you're doing something else, and the thought pops into your head, and you go, oh, yeah, I've I got to do something about that. That's, that's one of these open loops where you haven't really decided about it, you haven't taken care of it, and your brain's going to take it on itself to remind you that you haven't done it yet. The problem happens when you have a whole bunch of these that pile up. There is a limited amount of processing cycles in our brain, and there's a limited amount of room in our RAM. There's a productivity expert named David Allen, and he has, uh, he has a saying, every message that is in your inbox represents an unmade decision. It's one of these open loops. The pro we've, we've all done this. We, put some, we have something in our inbox, and we say, I just don't want to deal with this now, and we just leave it there. I'll come back to it later. The problem with leaving these unmade decisions in our inbox is putting off a decision means that you have to make that decision again every time you look at it. The other interesting brain research that's come up recently is making decisions actually takes chemical energy, and that chemical energy can be depleted. And every time you make a decision, even if it is to not decide, you have exhausted a certain amount of your brain's potential. Has anybody ever been on a diet and then hit the end of a long day with lots of decisions and totally snarfed whatever was on their plate? It's because your brain has literally run out of the chemical energy it needs to, to make decisions. It happens with our email, too. Not processing leads to decision paralysis. Has anybody been here? You open your email and say, I just, I don't want to deal with it. That's because there are so many unmade decisions that they have just piled up to the point where you can no longer do anything about them. Decision paralysis, you know what it feels like because you've all felt it. Here's what it looks like. Your inbox starts just taking off because you're not taking care of anything in it, so everything just starts to pile up. Decision paralysis sounds like this. You're having a conversation in the lunchroom. Randy, did you get my email? I can't deal with it right now. I've got too many other things in my email. So that's what decision paralysis sounds like. Did you get my email? Processing allows us to make a decision once and only once about every message in our inbox. It's tremendously freeing to make a decision once. And really, there are only five decisions that you can make. The first one is, this is my second favorite, delete it. It comes to me, I can't act on it, I don't need it, I delete it. And my brain goes, Phew. I'm not thinking about that one anymore, that's done. The second decision you can make is to just do it. And this is my favorite one. This is where you get something, and it takes less than five minutes. Uh, Quinn, will you send the ABC meeting minutes to Janice? Why, yes, yes, I will. And I send it to Janice. Off it goes, my brain goes, it's gone. I don't have to think about it anymore. 
And, and the reason it's my favorite is I actually get to check off my box that I did something today. I actually accomplished something today. I sent an email to Janice. That's great. The third decision you can make is you can delegate it. And we all have this happen. Stuff comes to our inbox, and it's not really for us. So we send it on its way. Now, there's two flavors of delegation. There's the things that come to me that are really Regis, for instance. And I forward them off to Regis, and it's gone. I don't need to think about it anymore. There are things that come to you, Melanie, that don't belong to you, but they belong to somebody who works for you. And so you need to follow up on those. Your brain is not going to let it go because it knows I, I can't trust that darn Merrill. He's, I just have to follow up with him. So here's what we do. You set up a folder in your inbox called at follow up. And what does the at do? It makes that box rise to the top so that you don't forget it. And I'll talk about why that's important in a minute. But you take your message, you forward it to Merrill, and then you drop it in your at follow up box. And your brain goes, OK. That's done, because I will check my at follow-up box. And your brain will believe you until you don't check your at follow-up box. And it comes back and bites you, and then your brain says, I will never trust you again, and I'm going to hold on to this stuff, which defeats the whole purpose. So if you're going to use this method with the at follow-up, I suggest putting a calendar reminder that pops up every morning or every other day that says, check your at follow-up. And that way your brain will trust you. It says, OK. I know you're actually going to get back to this, and whew, it's gone. OK, so that's delegated. Any questions about delegate, defer? Yeah, yeah. Sue. Um, on the follow-up, since you sent it to somebody, do you send it to them and say, do you put your sent item in that follow-up, or do you put the original email in the follow-up? The question is, do you put the sent item into the follow-up or the original item into the follow-up? I take the original item and stick it into my follow-up, because I don't really need to know what the sent item was. I've got enough processing power. And I do this infrequently enough that it doesn't matter. Um, but that's an excellent idea, taking the actual sent mail and dropping it in your at follow-up. Because then you can recall exactly what it is you told that knucklehead Merrill to do, and, find, and, and you can follow up with it and said, I told you to do this. Did you do it? And Merrill can say, of course I did. What am I? I'm not a total loser here. So that, that's, that's delegate. Any other questions about these first three? These are really great. You can do these like that. Make a decision. The fourth one is to defer it. I don't really like this one. I got to tell you, it leaves me hanging a little bit. But you have to take it into account. There are things that you get that are yours. You have to act on them. But I can't act on it right now. I got to wait until Steve gets back on Monday. or. This is going to take me more than five minutes. This is going to take me two hours. I don't have two hours right now. I will do it tomorrow. Uh, there are two ways to approach things that are deferred. I put things on a task list. I make a task, and I say, at this time, I will do this thing, and my computer will remind me to do that, and it'll pop up, and I don't have to worry about it. My brain goes, Quinn's got this. The other way you can do it, if you don't want to use a task list, is to set an at action, or act act folder, um, similar to the at follow-up. And you put your action items in there. And again, you have to remember to look at that folder, or your brain is not going to remember to do it. It's never going to trust you. All right, so that's defer it. Either way, it gets it out of your inbox, and it gets you out of your mind. Whew. Your brain's not going to keep reminding you, hey, you need to do your expense report, because it knows that you have scheduled a time for it. The fifth one is file it. And this one's easy. You get something. You can't act on it. It's not your item, but for some reason, whatever, you can't delete it. Drop it into a file. And by the way, it doesn't matter where you put it. Some of us have really elaborate file systems. But it doesn't matter where you put it, because your computer is smart enough to find stuff. And if you say, I have this, I sent a message to Cheryl. It was about the ABC committee. I can type in Cheryl ABC, and it's going to find it for me. And here's the little secret. Almost all the stuff you put in your file, you will never need again. So don't stress over the filing. But do file it. Get it out of your inbox and out of your mind. Using this system, it really is possible to never check your email. This is how I have gone over a year without checking my email. And this is what's freed me up. So are you ready for the first challenge? 
Okay? Here it is. Process all of your messages every time you open your inbox. And what I mean by process, make the decision. You don't have to do it, but you do have to make a decision. Free up your mind. Don't let it keep chewing on this. This is going to be actually kind of hard. Um, it took me over a month <laughs> to make this work because I would get to my inbox and I'd, oh, I didn't mean to open my mail. I don't want to open my mail right now. I don't have time to open my mail. Um, but I made it a habit. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to get in the habit of not leaving these open loops. Um, so that's what I do. All right, any questions about the first concept? Never check email again. OK, let's talk about the second concept. Defeat distraction. Everybody knows what a distraction is, right? Here's the truth. We get what we focus on consistently. Does anybody disagree with that? All right. The corollary to we get what we focus on consistently is if we don't focus, we don't get. And we all want to get. There are many distractions you cannot do anything about. But you can totally eliminate email as a distraction. We're going to talk about how. Let me just tell you about a job I used to have. I used to order a lot of printed material. And so I would call up the printer and I'd say, hey, I need to print either 5,000, 8,000, or 10,000 of these pieces of a brochure. Tell me how long it's going to take. How much is it going to cost? The printer would get back to me. He'd say, well, for 5,000, it's going to take five days, and it's going to cost you $2,300. For 8,000, it's going to take you five days, and it's going to cost you $2,600. For 10,000, it's going to cost five days, and it's going to take $2,850. What do you notice about these numbers? You notice that it doesn't take any more time to print twice as much, and it doesn't cost much more to print twice as much. And the reason for that is that most of the time and the cost is in the setup. That's making plates, that's running proofs, that's loading the ink in, that's cleaning stuff. And in every case, it didn't matter how many I was printing, the setup took longer than the actual print job. And this is important because everything you do has a setup. That setup might be physical, gathering the material you need to do your job, or psychological, getting into, the, to getting into the zone. And we've all been in the zone, right? You've been working along, and you're focused. You're, you're cruising along. You don't know what time it is. You don't care what time it is. You are just a machine. And you're going and going, and then somebody stops by your office, knocks on the door, and says, hey, did you know we're having a staff meeting tomorrow? And everything is reset. There was a study that was done in 2005 by the Basics Company, and it determined that when you're in that mode, doing a complex task, and you're, you're totally there, any interruption can take up to 45 minutes for you to recover, to get back to the level you were at. 45 minutes. So we need to avoid getting interrupted. And what is the worst interruption you can possibly... Sorry, I thought I turned that off. Where is it? Okay. What is, the worst no what is the worst thing that can possibly happen to you when you... Okay. The worst thing that can happen is that blue box popping up on your screen. Has anybody ever had this happen to them? The blue box pops up and you click on it and then you click on something else and then you have to go talk to somebody and make a phone call and then you come back and you have to Google something and an hour and a half later it's lunchtime and you say, what happened to my morning? What happened was this blue box. There should be nothing in your inbox that is worth being interrupted for. And we'll talk in a little bit about how you can make sure there's nothing in your inbox worth being interrupted for. But can you understand why I say there's nothing in your inbox worth getting interrupted for? The reason is because it's your job to do your work. Nobody else knows what you need to do. Not even your boss knows what the best use of your time is, but you do. And if you stop doing what you know you should be doing because your inbox told you to, that's a mistake. So turn off your notifications. I cannot stress this enough. If you get up and walk out, as Matt Moore just did, <laughs> if you do nothing else, go back to your desk and turn off your notifications. If you don't listen to anything else I say, please go back to your desk 
and turn off your notifications. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Because it will change your life. Um, I was teaching this concept to somebody, and, and he uh, came back the next week, and I asked people to report on how their no turning off notifications went. He said, I, I turned off my notifications, and then I went to work, and I was working on this brief, and three hours passed, and I finished the brief, and I suddenly panicked because I hadn't seen an email in three hours. And I said, so what was it? What, what, what happened? He said, well, I had a lot of email. And I said, was any of it important? He was really disappointed. He said, no, nothing was important. Turning off your notifications will change your life. Turn them off on your desktop, turn them off on your phone, turn them off on your iPad. There is nothing worth getting distracted for. All right, second one. Process your email in batches. This saves both time and helps you to avoid distraction. Batching means taking like tasks and doing them all at once. For email, it means uh, letting your email build up to a certain point and then taking care of it all at once when you're in the zone, when you're, you're set up. Remember the law of the setup. This is the way I used to process my email. Actually, I didn't process it. I just opened it and checked it. The gray bars are times when I would be in my email. And the blue bars are times when I wasn't in my email, so I could actually do something productive. Here's the alternative. This is how I process my email now. The gray bars, again, are times when I'm in my email. The blue times are times that I'm doing something useful. By the way, email is not useless. Email is an important part of our jobs. It's an integral part of our jobs. This is how we communicate. Remember this, your email inbox is a to-do list that was created by somebody else, not by you. And you need to do what you need to do. And that's what you do in these blue periods. Yes? And do you find that you're spending more of the time on the email or less? The question is, do I spend more time or less on the email? Doing it this way, I spend a lot less time I mean, because of the setup. I am getting it all taken care of at once. And as we'll talk about here in the third concept, I'm getting a lot less email because I'm doing it this way. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. You're going to get the same amount of email whether, even when you go on vacation. If you take a day off, you're going to have the same amount of email at the end of the day, whether you're out of the office or whether you're in the office. People are just going to send it to you. So you may as well just take care of it all at once instead of checking it all day long. Any questions on this? This, this changed my life. I saw this in a book. Uh, it's called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, if you ever want to read it. I don't agree with a lot of it, but this concept rocks. How often should you batch? Well, I tell people that they should batch as infrequently as possible. The guy who wrote that book, Tim Ferriss, he claims to batch once a week. If you email him on Tuesday, you will not hear from him until Monday, because he checks his email on Monday. Nobody here is going to get away with that. But do it as infrequently as you can. If people start to complain, add an extra batch until you can get people to get used to the fact that you won't be immediately available. And this raises an interesting question. Should you tell people that you're batching? I think you should, probably should. Um, that way they can know, uh, certainly probably your boss you should tell, so that he knows, you know what, uh, this, is in, this is urgent, I better call. And when you set up your batching and you tell your boss that you're going to batch, you say, look, this is going to help me be productive. Um, if you have anything urgent, call me or text me or work out something. Uh, guess how many things are actually urgent? Really, really small amount of things are actually urgent. Uh, I was not that smart. When I started doing this, I said, well, this is an interesting experiment. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm batching, because I wanted to see if anybody noticed. Turns out people were really interested in sending email. They're not that interested in getting it back. Nobody noticed. I, I went on like this for weeks and weeks, checking my email. At that time, I was checking my email twice a day. And nobody said, you know, you're not being very responsive to my email, which shocked me. Um, right now I check, I batch three or four times a day depending on how involved I am with a particular project that's headed by a particular person who is a little bit unpredictable. But um, batch as infrequently as possible and I do suggest you tell your boss and others who are important, who you interact with a lot that, that you're batching so that they can know to make other arrangements. All right, you ready for the next challenge? Can you guess what it's going to be? Turn off your notifications. This is the most important one. I can't stress it enough. Go back to your desk, turn off your notifications. And then decide what time you will batch. 
a good suggestion might be nine o'clock in the morning so that you can actually get one thing done before you open your email and get lost. And then before lunch and then after lunch and then before you go home. And then do that. Don't just decide, actually do it. Okay, any questions about how to defeat distraction? Let me reiterate how important it is that you have the ability to focus. That is what allows us to get anything done. To make any progress requires focus. All right, here we go. Third concept, train your email. Do you know you can train your email? You can train anything in this world, except cats, to do what you want them to do. Um, who has a dog? Anybody? Have you ever, have any of you who have dogs trained your dog to do something? So how did you train your dog? Yeah. Isn't it interesting how dogs really just really love to get in? There are two things that dogs seem to really like. They like to get praise, and they like to get treats. And that's, you know, that's how you train a dog, is you strategically give it what it wants. And everything wants something. It may seem strange, but this raises the question, what does email want? We don't think it wants anything. It's not alive. But viruses aren't alive, but they want a warm, moist environment. Your email does want something. I was once on a street visiting with one of my college professors, and he had an 18-month-old son. And his son was hanging on his leg as we were talking in the street, and he was saying, hi, daddy, hi, daddy, hi, daddy, to nobody in particular. So sometimes to his dad, sometimes to us. This is what your email wants. Like a toddler, your email wants all of your attention and the attention of everybody who you know. But unlike a toddler, email will never be cute and it will never grow out of this phase. But understanding what email wants allows us to train it. So let's talk about how to train email. The basis of our training is the less email you send, the less email you get. So let's talk about your email. First thing you want to do if you have a fat dog, for instance. Well, so we have this dog here. And this poor thing just got a treat from its master. It's the last thing this dog needs. How many of you have email that look like this dog? Well, let's slim it down. The way you put a dog, the way you train a dog, and the way you put it on a diet is you focus on calories, but you also want to focus on nutrients, because dieting is not just about calories. So let's look first at calories. How much food is in your dog dish right now? Right now. Yeah, your dog's dish. There's nothing in your dog's dish. Why is that? We give our dog food on our schedule, not on the dog's schedule. Because every dog I've ever met, there is no way to keep the dog dish full. It will eat until it looks like, like that thing. Well, this is how we train our email. And if we compare it to the dog, leaving the dog dish empty is like batching our email. We're not paying attention to it except when it's time to pay attention to it. And then we'll throw out a bacon bit or something. So that's, that's part of the importance of batch processing. The other way we can reduce calories is by a timely response. And this may sound like it is in opposition to batch processing, but timely just means at the right time. Well, we all know what happens when you don't do a timely response, right? If you, if you don't respond to somebody in the time that they want you to, you get another email, and this time it's copied to your boss saying, hey, loser, why didn't you get back to me on my earlier email? So what is timely? Unfortunately, timely is not something that we get to decide. It's decided by the people with whom we're corresponding. And if we have given people the impression that we will always get back to them within 30 seconds, then timely is for them 30 seconds. And we need to educate them that we're no longer going to do that. I work to get people to expect that a timely response from me will be by the end of the day. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Email was never intended to be an instant, instant messaging system. We have an instant messaging system. You know, if you want to use that, use that. It's not email. So timely responses prevent more email. And then, oh, this is so big. CC and reply all. These are the calorie bombs of email. Once you start CCing people, email straps on its lobster bib and it just goes to town. 
there are companies that have set out rules that say, for every CC, you have to pay us 50 cents. Because they've recognized that this is a huge problem and a, a big drain on their time. That's ridiculous. CC is actually useful. Does everybody know where CC comes from? The old people are, are nodding their heads. OK, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to say old people. The people who had typing classes in high school are nodding their heads. Um, this is how I think of CC and how I resist the temptation to CC people. Back in the day, if you wanted to CC people, you had to pull out this black piece of paper and you would roll it into the typewriter between two white sheets of paper, or you would take two black sheets and roll it between three white sheets, and you would hit the keys really hard. I had a manual typewriter. You hit the keys really hard to get the impression to go all the way through all the sheets of paper. And then you went and washed your hands because they were all smudgy, and you'd get fingerprints all over anything. Before I CC somebody, I ask myself, if this were harder to do, would I do it? Does this person really need to receive this message? And so I don't CC very many people. And I strip a lot of names off of Reply All before I send a, a reply. And nobody ever thanks me for it. Because they don't know I did it, because they didn't get the message. But you're all welcome, <laughs> OK? I have saved you so many emails. Do this. Do this challenge. Before you respond to an email, do it in a timely manner and think carefully about each CC and each reply all. Save yourself time. Oh, and by the way, what happens if you CC a whole bunch of people? There's a, there's a perverse law here. The more people you send a message to, the less likely it is that anybody is actually going to do anything about it. I know when I get a message that has 15 people on it, I'm like, well, I don't need to do anything with this. Somebody else is clearly intended. Somebody else is, is going to take care of this. CCing everybody does not help in any way. It doesn't help anybody. So give serious thought before you CC or reply all. Now we've talked about calories. Let's talk about good nutrition for your email. The first thing, and I, I really love this, write if-then messages. This reduces so much email. Let's say I want to know if the ABC committee meeting in Denver is taken care of. Is it set up? John's responsible for the ABC committee. I send John an email. I say, John, is the ABC committee in Denver taken care of? And John emails me back and says, no, was I supposed to do that? Uh, who should I get to help me? And I send back an email and say, John, have Carly help you set up the ABC meeting in Denver and uh, work with her on this. And then John sends me back an email and says, OK, Carly's working on it. Uh, should we do anything? What, what else do I need to do? John's a new hire. It's OK. And then I have to send John back an email telling him what to do when he gets the ABC committee meeting set up. If I write an if-then message, I send this instead. Sending if-then messages takes a little bit more work on your part because you have to anticipate what the questions are going to be. You have to anticipate what instructions are going to be required. But you don't have time to go back and forth with John on this meeting. You're batching. You're only checking your email three times a day. So if there are four exchanges, this message is going to take more than a day for you to, to do. So if you're batching, you have to write if-then messages. And isn't this nicer? John knows exactly what to do. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And you're not going to get three messages back. So if-then messages, really powerful tool. Any, any comments or questions on if-then messages? <coughs> All right. The next thing we want to look at is formatting your messages, whether for the large screen or the small screen. But recognize that 40% of the messages you send now are read on a phone. And where people had really short attention spans on their computers, they are microscopic on a phone. And we have gotten into the habit of sending messages with these long introductions, the preamble, the background, and then at the end, so would you do x, y, and z? Instead, put what it is you want them to do in the very first line. Ask yourself, if John only reads the first line of this message, will he know why I'm sending it? I put what I want him to do in the first sentence, and then I say, after this is any background material if you feel like you need it. This is great because John knows he's supposed to do something, 
and he's provided the resources to do it. Any comments on formatting our email? Write short, short messages, as short as you can get away with. If you have to write a long message, recognize that you have an obligation to help the person get through that message. And we do that by short paragraphs that lead the eye, or even better, lists. Uh, and those are the bulleted lists. Everybody knows how to do those. We've got the task bar, formatting bar in Outlook. Um, lists just lead the eye right through everything that you need them to do. You have the obligation to get your reader to the end of their message. All right, and the final thing about good nutrition is only one topic per message. This seems counterintuitive because I said, send less email, get less email. So surely if there are six things I want John to do, I should just put them in one big email and be done with it. No. Email is not about being, it's not about quantity. It's about being effective. So I want to send John messages that he can actually use. And if I send him a message that says, six things I'd like you to do this week, uh, he, he won't be able to find the message again when he's looking for, one of those things was check on the ABC agenda. Um, if he wants to find the ABC agenda, I didn't label it ABC agenda. How's he going to find it? How's he going to report back to me that he did the ABC agenda? Because it's in there with six other things. How is he going to file or delete that message when it's done? He can't until he's done all six of those things. So only one message per topic. And here's your last challenge. Write at least one if-then message this week. Learn how to do it. See how well it works. And with all of your messages, put your action in the first sentence and don't send any more messages that have multiple topics. Any questions about how we can slim down our email, how we can train our email? And by the way, when you do these things, you will get less email and you will get no more urgent email because you have trained people on how to do this. In the case of the if-then, you have already answered the questions that people are going to ask you. So, if you do these five challenges that I've given in this presentation, you will change your relationship with email. Email is a fabulous, fabulous tool. It's powerful. We can communicate with anyone in the world instantly. Email is a terrible, terrible boss. Fabulous tool, terrible master. When you learn to do your email better, you will gain time and you will gain control of your life. Does anybody have any other questions? that? Anything that we want to talk about, anything that clarifies, any encouragement on how to do any of the challenges that I've set out? Yes? I just want to talk about text messages. I know this is a little different than just eight journal email. Eight. Put the name I heard one talk about text messages. I know this is a little different because you're addressing email. But I understand that if it takes more than two messages, you really should be picking up the phone and addressing it in the conversation. Right. That, that's yeah, there, you know, the right tool for the right task. Uh, there are times when email is a terrible idea, and you should get up and walk over to somebody's desk. Actually, that's not even a really good idea, because then you're going to interrupt them on whatever it was they're doing. But you can send them a message and say, can we talk at your convenience about X, Y, and Z? Pick up the phone and call somebody. Uh, that is often a much faster. It really depends. Ask yourself, what's the best way I can have this conversation? What's the best way I can accomplish my goal? And by the way, there's a, there's a corollary to this. You can use email to head off a whole bunch of other time-wasting things. Somebody, for instance, will send me an email or leave me a voicemail. And they'll say, hey, can you get back to me and tell me where I can find this document? It's on your website somewhere. I don't know where. And they leave me this you know, 45, 50 second message. I never respond to those by voicemail. Because anybody who calls me is in our global address list. I can type their name at the top of my Outlook field. I can find out their email address. And I can send them an email. And I can even attach the document that they were looking for. And that way. I'm not going to call them back and miss them because they're not at their desk. They're in a meeting or they're on the phone. I'm going to get their email and I'm going to have to leave them a message and hopefully they'll understand the message and not have to call me back so we can eliminate voice tag with email. So you can, you can use email to head off long, pointless uh, phone tag sessions. You can also use email, oh, I love this, 
you can use email to head off meetings. And meetings are the second biggest time suck in the world, right? We love meetings. Meetings are fun. They really are. We, we love having meetings. But they, are, they can be a huge waste of time. Somebody sends you a meeting request, or somebody says, hey, can we sit down and talk about whatever? You can respond with an email and say, sure. Or if they're in person, you can say, absolutely. Happy to sit down and talk with you so that I can prepare for it. Why don't you tell me what it is that your question is, what we need to talk about, and send that to me in an email, and then I'll get it calendared. And then here's, here's the sneaky part. You look at what they're asking, you figure out how to answer it, and you send them an email with the answer. Bang! Meeting gone! And you get to go home at 6 or at 5. Okay? You can't eliminate all of your meetings this way, but so many meetings, they're not really very well thought out. They're frankly not necessary. And if you can find that out by email first, you can really take care of a, a huge time suck there. Unless you want to have the meeting, in which case go ahead and have the meeting. Any other comments or thoughts? This is an important topic. The better you get at it, the more time you'll have, the more freedom you have, the more empowered you will feel, and that's good for not just you, but for everybody here at this company.